Hey, hi, Paul Slack is Good News Plan. I'm here with Lisa Skinner. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Hi. Good morning. I'm fine. Behavioral expert uh, in the field of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's and uh, summer. Five tips to for caretakers to help navigate the hot summer weather, really. So, uh, well, let's start off about Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is, uh, is what? What is Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's disease is a brain disease, a degenerative progressive brain disease that causes dementia. So when we use the term dementia, we're really using an umbrella term that describes the symptoms that show up uh, as a result of brain disease. And one thing a lot of people don't realize, there are over a hundred brain diseases that cause dementia. But Alzheimer's is the most common one and the one that we hear about most often. But Parkinson's disease is another one, Lewy body disease, there, there actually are over a hundred. So um, the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is attacking the short-term memory. But so most people associate Alzheimer's with memory loss and confusion, but it's actually much more complicated than that. It really has a huge impact on a person's life. And eventually um, they, they'll show a decline in their ability to reason and their ability to use judgment about things. And it changes their personalities and uh, behaviors um, show up. And this is all part of the disease. So how does, if you don't mind, how does some uh, doctor, a neurosurgeon or whoever, how do they know that it's Alzheimer's and not Parkinson's? How do, how do, how, what are the, the, each one of those disease, hundred say diseases have a different uh, indications? They do. There's a lot of similarities in the signs and symptomology. There are some tests for like Huntington's disease and Parkinson's disease. There's no definitive Alzheimer's. So it's more process of elimination um, the, right now, but things are changing. The only way to definitively diagnose Alzheimer's disease is after the person already passes and they do an autopsy and find plaques and tangles on the brain. Have a do. Is there any, uh, uh, is, I know we're going to talk about how to handle the summertime and heat and things like that. But prior to that, is there any, uh, any things that people do? Are they taking is there medicines, new medicines out there? Or is there um, any kinds of exercise? What, what can somebody do to, uh, to one, either avoid it? And I'm sorry if you don't mind me asking this. To avoid it or the easier, a nicer, a kinder, more loving way to live with it? Those are uh, both really great questions. The answer to the first one is um, there are many risk factors that go into factoring in a person's um, risk level as to whether or not they might develop d d or Alzheimer's disease or one of the other brain diseases. And the number one risk factor that goes against all of us is age. This is an older person's disease, unless it's the genetic form of Alzheimer's, which is called early onset, which can show up anytime before the age 60. Um, the typical common Alzheimer's disease typically shows up after the age of 65. There are modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. And the number one risk factor for all of us is our age. And that's obviously non-modifiable. We have no control over our aging process. So we all live with that. We're all at um, risk of developing Alzheimer's based on our age. And for every five years after the age of 65, the risk goes up of developing it. Now, there are quite a few risk factors that are considered modifiable or manageable. The second one 
is cardiovascular disease, believe it or not, high blood pressure and um, any type of heart condition is the second highest risk factor to developing Alzheimer's disease. However, with that said, cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease is manageable. So if you have a heart condition, if you have high blood pressure, if you have high cholesterol, those can be managed with medications. So if they're being managed, then that would negate that from being a high risk factor. There are a lot of things that people can do no matter what your age is now to lower your risk of developing dementia after the, or Alzheimer's disease after the age of 65. And diet and exercise are the two most important things. Okay. Wow. All righty. Uh, are you related to B.F. Skinner? <laughs> no, people ask me that all the time, but no, I'm not, I don't think so. <laughs> well, you, you have the psychological uh, uh, factors of consideration for Alzheimer's, uh, and, uh, right? There's and training. Why, why this field? And then we'll get into uh, helping uh, with uh, during this, this period of time. And I also was told you had a pill that made us younger. Now, is that, is that also, it was that, that was my second question. That well, it's not on that... yet, but yeah, it's. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I like good sense of humors, but or maybe it's not. Shh, don't tell anybody you got that pill. No, no, I'm keeping it to myself. No, no, come on, share, please. Pretty, pretty, please. No. I'm actually 87 years old. I'm 190. <laughs> actually, I have the bill. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, why are you why are you so involved with Alzheimer's? My very first, okay, this is kind of unheard of, but I actually have eight, have had eight family members suffer from one of the brain diseases that causes dementia. And five of them are blood relatives and the other three were through marriage. So that actually puts me at a very high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease or one of the uh, diseases that causes dementia. My very first experience was my grandmother. She lived with it for 20 years. The average is about eight to 15, but she had it for a extraordinarily long period of time. It was a very interesting and unique experience because she displayed probably the extreme of the symptoms. She had the delusions and the hallucinations and the paranoia and the outbursts. And, and I, you know, I was a teenager. I was very impressionable and I was close to my grandmother and it really had an impact on me watching my grandmother decline that way. And then when I went to college, I took a course on human behavior. I was originally thinking psychology, but this course was specifically on human behavior. Basically, what makes people act the way they do? What makes them tick? And I, I was absolutely sold. I was so fascinated by human behavior. I decided to pursue my degree in that. And then I just kind of followed the yellow brick road, I guess you could say. And I ended up using my degree in human behavior in the elder care industry as a counselor to help families understand the disease. And I have spent over 25 years doing that. I've been a regional director and managed five buildings and set up memory care units and trained caregivers and counseled thousands of families. And then I had my own business and then I wrote a book. So um, the thing that I've discovered over the 25 years of helping families is a lot of people don't have a, uh, have a true comprehensive understanding of what it's really like to live with Alzheimer's disease. And my approach is from a psychosocial um, standpoint, the day-to-day -day challenges that not only the people who suffer from Alzheimer's disease, but the family members and the caregivers, it is such a complicated disease. It goes on for years and it's very stressful for everybody involved. 
I've been through it both personally and professionally, and I really made a commitment to help others. I've led uh, support groups um, because people don't know how to respond to the behaviors. They don't know how to respond to the false beliefs. So I kind of just decided that I wanted to be a resource to help people have a better time or an easier time going through this journey with their loved one and just focus on what matters, the time they have left to spend with their loved one. Okay, you go into the mensch category, if you know what that is. Mensch in Yiddish means a very good, kind, loving, caring person. You're under that uh, that uh, that that uh, uh, genealogical uh, tree under the mensches of uh, people that care about others, and you're very, very kind and and simplifying a scenario and 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 patient. I'm sure many you've helped many people. I can tell by just our conversation now. Well, Let's thank you. and and. You know, uh, the one I just spoke of that was my first experience. My grandmother spoke um, fluent Yiddish. She was from Poland. Yeah. Okay. Well, there, there it is. I, actually, I think it, uh, I don't know whether you know the, this, but because uh, my family all has it. And I've dealt with it as well. Almost uh, but one side of my family has, has had these things, Parkinson's and possibly Alzheimer's and other things. And so, um, and strokes, things like that. Um, and uh, Polish, European Jews. Um, and, uh, and somewhere I heard that that possibly is a, uh, a, concern, a concern, that that's something, uh, maybe it was too much borscht or something. I don't know, gefilte fish. I, you know, sometimes we don't know why. And I did the brain series, actually, PBS, a 10 part series. I was involved with brain. Uh, neuroscientist Richard Resnick out of La Jolla. Um, so brain is this, and this is what you're talking about, very important to me also personally and just family-wise. Um, we didn't even get to what we were going to talk about, the, the water and, the, and, and during this period of time. Yeah, it's getting cool out. Uh, but in any case, uh, let, let's go to that. Do you, first of all, right now, do you have a website? How do people reach you? Because I'm into, you know, you really have a lot of assets to share with people you well Are you best, a website? i have a website but i think a better resource for people is to go to my blog because i post a lot of helpful tips and information and tools on my blog for people who are experiencing this they'll find it on facebook and it's called not all who wander need be lost not all who one wonder wander wonder w o n d e r or wander w a n wander. W -A -N, wander not all who wander be lost need be lost need be lost i'll have to say something as a good uh, as a communication uh, guy, which is what I've, I've done, that's a pretty long uh, blog name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You can't do it like a, they call it bitlies. No, I don't think that's for those. But, you know, I try to shorten it up a little. But in any case, don't, I, I say that lovingly. Um, in any case, all right, well, but if, you know, one thing about things uh, is that people that really want to know something are going to figure it out. The, your name uh, alone, if somebody uh, types in your name, I mean, I'm very serious about it. I'm hearing a lot of important information from you. Lisa Skinner, as, uh, if they go to Google and they search you, will that come up, your Facebook uh, uh, blog, you think? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. All right, now let's go to the five tips for caretakers to help navigate the hot summer weather. Um and why is that more important than the cold winter weather? <laughs> oh, for several reasons. Now, just in general, elderly people, as our bodies age, we lose the ability to regulate heat in our bodies. And due to that, 
p- older people have a tendency to overheat more easily than their younger counterparts oh. and throw Alzheimer's disease or brain disease into that mix and people lose their ability to reason for judgment. So a lot of people can't tell that they're overheating. And um, so caregivers or family members. Oh boy. You're back. Okay. Caregivers or family members really need to be the eyes and the ears for people with Alzheimer's disease in the hotter weather. And the other thing that happens to people with dementia is they can't tell if they're thirsty. A lot of times they can't tell if they're thirsty. If they can't tell if they're thirsty, they're not going to ask for a drink. So caregivers, family members, please offer continuous um, fluids to people so they will not become dehydrated because becoming dehydrated is a risk for heat illnesses and also heat stroke. Many of our elderly do pass from heat stroke during the summer because they're not well protected. So if you do take them outside, make sure it's not in the peak of the the hottest sun times during the hours of like 10 or 11 till three or four in the afternoon. Always make sure that their skin is, is properly protected with sunscreen. Uh, Older people's skin is very thin. They can burn very easily. Um, Have them wear sunglasses and hats. If you do outdoor activities, which are wonderful for people with Alzheimer's disease, they love being outside. It helps tap into their five senses, which stimulates their brains and triggers memories. Um, Try to keep them shaded or go before the sun is the strongest or after. Um, Have them wear loose clothing. That's important. But the very most important critical piece is to be well hydrated. And if they refuse water or fruit juices, which are recommended, no caffeine, no alcohol, You can offer them smoothies or fruit or ice chips. Popsicles are wonderful hydrating mechanisms for uh, people. Uh, They love popsicles and smoothies and things like that. But just make sure that they're well hydrated to um, maximize their safety during the summer heat. Was that all five? Oh, uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay, you didn't give me a one, two, three, four, five. So, uh, but you said a lot of different things, which are all good. So, uh, and to tip one, uh, keep elders dementia out of the direct sun, extremely hot environments. Keep two, keep seniors well hydrated. This is critical. Three, uh, and we've put the text with this as well. Be mindful of these lifestyles and health factors. They uh, increase the risk of developing heat related illnesses. Four, watch for signs of heat exhaustion, which may perceive a more serious heat stroke. And that's that. Have a person lie down in a cool place if you can. Keep a fan on them. You're fantastic. Not all who wander need be lost. Okay, let me ask you one last question. Uh, We're involved with World Peace, International Day of Peace, September 21st. Uh, in fact, if you're in New York, I'm invite you to a party. Um, oh. And then stay on a second after we finish. Um, uh, what does peace mean to Lisa Skinner? What's peace oh. for you? But peace means to me that everybody is tolerant of other people. They don't pass judgments if somebody doesn't believe exactly the same thing that they do, that's okay. We, we're we all individuals and we all are entitled to our own beliefs, but to have peace, we need to be tolerant of other people's beliefs. And I'm not seeing that these days. I haven't seen it for a long time. People to get along and accept each other for who they are and 
be tolerant of one another. And I think that, um, and all work toward the greater good, not just for what you think is the best thing for yourself, but for the greater good for everybody is what my idea of world peace would be about. Ah, beautiful. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, it's a, a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you.